We've done several videos on our EcoFlow power station setup. This is going straight over to the rig. So we'll get that plugged into the adapter. But recently we've gotten a lot of questions about our complete electrical setup, what it looks like, how it's integrated, and why we chose that system over a traditional solar setup. So today we're looking at that complete setup, what it looked like when it came from the factory versus what it looks like now in that hybrid setup. And this isn't one of those videos that's gonna tell you that this is the best setup and this is what you have to have. This is what works for us. We're gonna talk about the things that we like, the things that we don't like, and the things that we've learned living with it full time. Now this rig came with a very basic standard electrical system. So from the factory, the RV had a 50 amp shore power system, a traditional RV distribution panel, 200 amp hour flooded lead acid batteries, one 330 watt solar panel on the roof, a 50 amp solar charge controller, and a factory installed inverter sub panel built into the main breaker box. All right, so do us a quick favor. If this is a topic or a video that you're enjoying, go ahead and hit that like button. And if it's something that you wanna see more of, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. By doing one or both of those, things, it helps us to know what you guys really want to see so we can continue making more of it. One of the most meaningful upgrades that we did in this RV was to replace the original 200 amp hour lead acid batteries in here with a single 300 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. We made that change for several reasons. So number one, there's a much higher usable capacity. Now the best thing about these lithium iron phosphate batteries is that you can actually discharge them all the way down to 100%. Number two, there's basically no routine maintenance. Maintenance on these things, again, is just pretty much getting out there every now and again and wipe it off with a rag. Number three, there's better voltage stability when it's under load. They charge faster and they just weigh far less than the lead acid batteries. Now on paper, we went from 200 amp hours to 300 amp hours, but in real life, that difference is much bigger with these lithium iron phosphate batteries because you can actually discharge these all the way down to 100%. Now, if you don't know exactly what that means, check out our video linked down below where we take a deeper dive into how to build a battery setup that fits your needs for how you use your rig. And then there's also a video linked down there to a review that we did on this specific battery here. And this new battery is much better suited to handle all of the 12 volt loads in the rig and also support all of our inverter backed outlets that we have, which brings us to our next upgrade. So this rig came from the factory pre-wired for an inverter. The way Grand Design has prepped this is basically that inverter breaker on the main breaker box feeds this loop of wire up in the front storage area, but it didn't actually have one installed. And here's how that works. So we've got a breaker inside of our breaker panel that is labeled inverter and it feeds a separate sub panel. And that sub panel powers all of the 120 volt outlets in the rig, but it doesn't power any of our large loads like our air conditioner or microwave or the fireplace. We'll get to how we power those off grid in just a little bit. This is actually a very small smart design because it keeps the inverter loads predictable and it prevents overloading. And we'll get back to that here in just a few minutes as well. So that next upgrade is this 2000 watt Renogy inverter with an automatic transfer switch that is tied directly into that sub panel. So when shore power is present, that power just passes straight through the inverter and it powers all of those outlets. And then if for some reason we lose shore power, then the automatic transfer switch in here switches over and now we're powering powering all those outlets from the battery via the inverter. And again, that's the only thing that's getting powered from this inverter is the outlets. In our setup, this is not about getting us off grid. This is really just about maintaining reliability because there are certain loads inside of this RV that we wanna make sure have power all the time. So first we have one of those fancy dog water bowls. It's got a pump and a filter and everything in it. And if that thing loses power when we're gone, then obviously our animals don't have anything to drink. And then number two, we wanna make sure that our Starlink internet stays up. That way we can remotely monitor temperatures inside the rig whenever we're not here. And again, that's all about the pets that travel with us. So if shore power drops when we're not here, then those loads stay on automatically. And that really was worth the peace of mind of installing that inverter. Okay, next, while it wasn't an upgrade, it came with the rig, as I mentioned earlier, is this 330 watt solar panel right here. 
This is tied into the battery and inverter setup. Now we're rarely on that inverter, but this solar panel will provide plenty of power to keep that battery topped up anytime we lose shore power or especially on those travel days to keep the 12 volt refrigerator going for you know that two and a half to three hours a day that we like to travel all right so let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages to just the systems that we've looked at so far so number one it's completely automatic meaning there's no user interaction required when we lose shore power it switches over automatically to the battery and the inverter number two we get very stable dc voltage thanks to the lithium iron phosphate battery, which is super important for some of those sensitive 12 volt electronics like the control board on these 12 volt refrigerators. Number three, we can use the factory installed wiring as it was actually intended to be used. And then finally, all of our critical loads stay powered without overloading either the battery or the inverter. And then of course, with any system, there are also some disadvantages to this. So number one, the capacity is intentionally limited so that we don't overload load that factory installed wiring. Number two, the battery draw happens quietly in the background. And what I mean by that is it transfers over to that battery and inverter automatically and seamlessly and honestly, very quietly. And that means that if and when we eventually lose shore power, we may not even know that we've lost shore power and that we're on our battery for a good period of time. And then finally, we just need to be mindful of what we're plugging into those outlets to prevent overloading and entripping that inverter, which we've done several times. But that's kind of why this whole system works. It works because it's not trying to do too much. We always like seeing how other people build out their RV power systems. Let us know in the comments what you're running and why it works for you. Now, even having that battery and inverter installed in here, that's really not a good solution to getting a big 50 amp rig like this off grid. And that's why we installed this power station setup, which includes an EcoFlow Delta Pro power station. This is my new setup. We've Again, we've got the single power station and then we've got uh, an extra battery, two extra batteries connected to the power station itself, which provides us 3,600 watts of power. We've got two extra batteries on it. It goes through a transfer switch to get up to the breaker panel. And then we've got two solar panels on the roof that are dedicated to keeping these batteries charged. And this system powers our rig just like shore power does. Now, granted, we're now limited to 30 amps total, but for us, that's really not a problem based on how we boondock. Now, I can run two air conditioners on this setup because we've got the soft starters installed. All right, so let's go ahead and get these air conditioners started. Now, you'll see here, I'm actually already pulling uh, about a thousand watts. I think we'll still have enough room here to get two ACs running. So let's go ahead and start this one. All right, so the fan's on and there we go. The compressor just kicked on, I heard it. Gotta give the Apple just a couple of seconds to catch up. All right, so now you can see we are at about 2300 watts. Okay, so this is actually a pretty good test here. So I'm sitting at about 2200 watts. I got 3600 watts available. I think we can still start this, so let's give it a All shot. Right. All right, the fan is running. Let's see what happens when that compressor kicks on. I don't know if it'll hold it or not. There we go, running. But we tend to not boondock in areas or during times of the year where we actually need air conditioning. But if we are in a campground somewhere and we lose shore power, I can still run those air conditioners off of this power station setup. So like I said, this power station setup works just like shore power, essentially. It energizes the entire breaker panel inside. So from the RV's perspective, it looks like we're just connected up to shore power, just like if we were in a campground. And just like shore power, this system is completely separate from the inverter battery setup. 
Now, as I've mentioned in previous videos, the big advantage for us, for this system here, is that it's much more portable than a traditional solar setup where you have all of the different components, the inverter, the charge controller, all of the wiring and cabling that you need to hook all of that stuff up. We don't have that with this. It's all contained in one single box. So it's just kind of like rolling your suitcase right through the airport. So what do you think? Nice and light when it gets like that, huh? much easier to move. So when we are connected to shore power, we can easily remove these things and take them elsewhere if needed, which means if we decide at some point we want to sell this RV and get a new one, I can easily disconnect this stuff in about five minutes and we just take it with us. So I really don't want to go into any more depth about this. If you are interested in learning more about what power stations are, what they're capable of and how you can use them. I'll put a link down in the video description that'll take you to a playlist that basically covers every video that we've done on these power stations. And it includes basically the entire evolution from when we first bought it all the way up to now. All right, to bring this all together, we've now got three electrical layers. We've got shore power, we've got the inverter backed outlets powered by the lithium iron phosphate battery, and then we've got full RV power via the portable power stations. Each layer exists for a different purpose. Shore power is still king when we have it. The inverter protects those critical loads automatically when shore power is lost. And then the power station enables us to get off grid for extended periods of time. All right, to make all of this easier to follow, I've put together a simple diagram to show the entire system and how it works. So here's the original 50 amp setup from the factory. Shore power comes in and it feeds the main breaker panel. The converter, along with that 330 watt panel on the roof and the charge controller, charged the original batteries. There's nothing fancy here, but it shows how the rig was designed. Next, we added that 2000 watt inverter with the automatic transfer switch, and then we upgraded the stock lead acid batteries to the lithium iron phosphate battery. And again, only the 120 volt outlets are backed up if shore power goes out. And then finally, we've got that portable EcoFlow Delta Pro system. This feeds the whole RV through a manual transfer switch when shore power is not available. And looking at the drawing, you can see how it sits separately from the inverter and the lithium battery, giving us that off-grid capability whenever we need it. So that's how everything fits together. Shore power is our primary source, the inverter protects the essential outlets, and the power station gives us that off-grid flexibility. And I think seeing it like this visually really helps make sense of the layers of power we're working with. All right, so now let's talk about some trade-offs and limitations. This setup works for us because we understand it and we're intentional about how we use it. There are multiple power paths, some manual decisions, and a learning curve that's involved. The next trade-off here is by design, there's no automatic transfer between shore power and the power station. Now, that's just a personal preference, and we've never been in a situation where we actually needed that automatic transfer of power to happen. And then as a bonus, the manual transfer switches are cheaper and they're easier to install. So this helped us reduce the cost of installation and the complexity of the install. And then finally, unlike some of the more complex traditional solar setups, there's no interaction between the power station and shore power. For example, some inverters like the Victron MultiPlus can team up with shore power. If the campground pedestal can't provide enough power, the inverter quietly adds battery power to make up the difference. That way your RV isn't tripping breakers. This isn't something our power station setup can do, but again, it's a decision we made based on how we use our rig. This setup makes sense for people who want automatic backup power for critical loads, travel full-time or boondock frequently, want flexibility without a full electrical rebuild, and people who understand basic RV electrical concepts. It's probably not a good fit if you want a single fully automated system or you don't wanna manage your power intentionally. This system didn't come from a blueprint. It's really evolved over time from real problems that we were trying to solve. The lithium battery makes the inverter reliable, the inverter protects the things that must stay on, and the power station gives us that off-grid capability and flexibility. And as with any electrical system, it's important to understand electrical loading and how to manage it. This is something you need to work through before building out your own system, whatever that system may be. You need to understand what real world usage looks like in order to determine things like how much battery capacity you need, what size inverter you need, or how big of a power station you might need to support how you use your own rig. The worst thing you can do is copy what others are doing because you'll probably end up either overspending on a system that's entirely too big 
or you'll find yourself wanting to add to it later. Fortunately, we've got you covered there and we've linked a couple of videos down below in the description that walk you through that whole process. If you're looking to upgrade your system with better batteries, an inverter or a generator, I strongly recommend you check out those videos to have a better understanding of all the concepts behind the decisions that you're gonna need to make. Alrighty folks, that is a wrap for this week. So as always, if you've liked this video, go ahead and hit that like button. While you're down there, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell button so you're notified for all of our future videos. And until next week, happy camping and stay safe out there.